So, good afternoon, everybody. You're incredibly welcome to Science Gallery Dublin, and it's wonderful to see you here on this Friday afternoon. Um, it gives me even great pleasure to welcome our speaker this afternoon, um, Robert Lightfoot, the acting administrator of NASA. Um, I, you guys, many of you are familiar with Science Gallery, and really we deal in big visions and big ideas and hope and aspirations for the future and where science can take us. And I think that's completely embodied by NASA in so many ways. This morning, I just very quickly looked at the website to see what was going on and the Kepler Space Telescope has just released a catalogue of 219 new planet candidates, 10 of which are near Earth size. The Earth Space Agency is developing a gravitational wave in partnership with NASA and there's going to be the first solar eclipse of the whole of the United States in 99 years at the end of August for which there's lots of activities going on as well. So it gives me huge pleasure that, that Robert is here today to speak to you all. Um, my role is quite simple. I'm going to introduce uh, Peter Galler, who, who's Professor of Astrophysics here in Trinity, who is deeply involved in this area, and he's going to give you some further introductions. Thank you. Well, well, thank you very much, Lynn. Um, I'm really excited and really delighted to welcome you all here to Trinity today and to the Science Gallery in particular. I'm uh, completely envious of the NASA administrator. It must be arguably the best job in the universe to be the head of NASA, going out there exploring the universe in ways that we've never seen before. Um, I began my career in NASA to give you an Irish connection back in 1995, working on a spacecraft called SOHO and uh, spent a lot time working at Goddard Space Flight Center and so even today we send students from Trinity um, out to NASA every single year and at the moment there's a uh, uh, two of uh, my PhD students who are out at NASA at the moment working at Goddard Space Flight Center so there's a tight connection between Trinity and NASA so that's why I'm particularly excited uh, and delighted as we say in Dublin uh, to uh, to to welcome um, the administrator to NASA Robert uh, Lightfoot. Welcome. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. All right, well, good afternoon. All right, there we go. All right, all right. Everybody's got to get a little excited here. This is going to be a good, good day. It is great to be in Ireland. I've never been here before. It's so exciting to uh, see the history that comes in here. I'm going to talk a little bit about the future, but I think it's really interesting to see how much history there is here and how the if you think about just going, just seeing the Book of Kells and thinking about how long ago that was and advancing forward what we could be doing that many years in the future, we're trying to set the foundation of that as we go today. And I'm going to walk through what NASA's up to, uh, what we're trying to do. It's an international, really global effort that we're trying to, trying to do in terms of this, this journey of exploration, discovery, and just advancing knowledge, which is what we think we do on a daily basis. No big deal. Just little stuff like that. So um, I, I'm just thrilled you guys are all here, and I re really appreciate you being here today. So let me walk through what we've been, what we've been doing. I'll quit turning around. Here we go. So um, the, second, or the first A in NASA stands for aeronautics. We're the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. We talk about space a lot, but we need to talk about what we do in aeronautics. And aeronautics, what we say is NASA's with you when you fly. If you've been on an airplane, it's probably got some system that NASA helped develop years ago, our environmental research around aeronautics and how to make aircraft safe, more safely, or more safe, more fuel efficient, less noisy, right, which is always a concern for people that live near an airport. Um, we, do a, we, we do a lot of work in just those fundamental, those fundamental areas. But what we're doing now that's really exciting is we're pushing the envelope on some of the research. We, are gonna, we actually are going to have our first X-plane in a long time. Now, X-plane to NASA is an experimental plane. It's an aircraft that we're going to design that's going to help us hopefully tackle a, a, a critical challenge, and in this case, it's, it's uh, the, the sonic boom challenge. So we want to we help start a supersonic aircraft process. You remember the Concorde, for those of you that are older, you remember the Concorde. It can only fly across, across the ocean because you can't have sonic booms over land. People get a little tired of that. It's a little annoying. So our job is a, as an agency, we're going to try to build a, a demonstrator that allows us to start figuring out ways to actually be able to fly supersonically, and it's called the low boom flight demonstrator, to, to dampen out the, the sonic boom. So that's, that's our, next, our first big X-plane in a long time for us in aeronautics. The other thing we're working on is hybrid electric airplanes, an all-electric plane. 
that, that, could, that you could use in the future. And then different body shapes. If you think about it, most people, when you think of an airplane, you think of what we call the tube and wing, the fuselage that we all sit in and the wings coming out. There's different shapes you can do that are actually more economic. They actually give you, more, they give you a lot more cargo room, and they're more fuel efficient in the general scheme. That's a big change, right? Um, but, we're only been, we've, but we've been able to do that because of things like composites um, and, and advances in technology that, that we do. So that's what we do in aeronautics. Is, uh, the, oh, and the final thing that we do in aeronautics that's really important is we're really working on air traffic management as associated with drones. As you might imagine, there's a lot of, a lot of drones uh, out there that seems to be a, an area that's increasing in interest. And for us, being able to take those drones um, and try to manage them so that we know where they are and when they're going through, it's important for us. And our guys are developing the algorithms and the the different modeling tools and techniques that allow us to actually follow that along. So that's what we're doing in aeronautics. We also have a huge effort in science. And so we think our job is to answer the fundamental questions. Is there life out there? Are we alone? All the different things that we do that we wonder as human, as the human race that we are. So we have four areas that I'll talk about. One is uh, heliophysics, which is the study of our sun um, that Peter knows quite a bit about, uh, I believe, probably more than me. He could probably come give the lecture on that one. Uh, study of our Earth, um, what's happening to our own planet. Planetary science, which we would study the planets that are, in our, uh, that are in our solar system. And then, as, and look for other planets, as, as we said earlier, look for other planets. And then astrophysics, which is really the looking out into the universe. Um, and these are the kind of the four fundamental areas we do in science. And, and I'll run through each of those a little bit. So this is the, called the Polar, P Parker Solar Probe. Uh, we just recently named it. Um, it used to be Solar Probe Plus. This is going to fly as close to the sun as we've ever flown before. And one of the main goals here for us is to understand the solar wind and its impact. Why do we care? Right? You, you, why do we care about those, these kind of things? Well, there's a lot of thought we don't understand about the sun. It's a living, breathing object, um, as you might imagine. And so we're trying to understand it better for a lot of reasons. First, for the impacts here on Earth. You know, we're protected somewhat by our magnetosphere in the, around, the, around the Earth, but we still want to understand what's going on and how the Earth impacts us on a daily basis, whether it's your cell phone, whether it's anything electrical, it's out there. The other thing we worry about is when we take um, astronauts outside the Earth's magnetosphere, they're no longer protected. The, mag the magnetosphere around Earth provides us quite a bit of protection. When crews and humans go outside that, we want to make sure they we understand what's happening with the sun so we can protect those crews because they're not going to have that, that protection of the magnetosphere anymore. So these are things that we're going to learn from this. It's going to get as close to the sun as we've ever gotten before. We said touch the sun. We're not really going to touch the sun, but we're going to get really close um, inside of the corona as we move forward. It's an exciting mission for us. It launches next year. Um, and, and it'll work in collaboration, as, as Peter and I were talking earlier, we're working in collaboration with the Solar Orbiter Collaborator. Solar over collaboration mission. So we're, it's, it's exciting. It's an exciting time to be studying our, our, own, our closest star as we look at all the other stars. So as was mentioned earlier, um, if, you're, if you're going to take vacation in, 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 uh, in August, come to the U.S. August 21st. It's going to be a total solar eclipse that runs from basically Oregon to South Carolina for us in the States. Um, another fa first time in 99 years, a very fascinating event for us, a lot to study. Uh, when, when you get this in that short period of time. So we're really excited to, do, to, to be able to see that. You know, we're having to tell everybody, don't look at the sun. Okay? This is, even though there's eclipse, please don't look at it uh, without the right tools. But it's going to be an exciting event for us and, and another chance for us to study um, in that short period of time, study uh, uh, all sorts of things about the sun. And everybody is really, I think the entire heliophysics community is going to be really tuned up to be there. I see, I see Peter shaking his head. Yep. Uh, you're going to be there, right? It's, yeah. So, yep. You're, Wyoming? Wyoming. Oh, very good. Uh, so anyway, so there's going to be, there's going to be a, a lot of people studying this as we go forward. So Earth science. Now, this is just a kind of a menu of all the missions we have. We have over 20 spacecraft on orbit today, basically taking any kind of measurement you can imagine, ocean height, ocean color, ice sheets, um, studying hurricane tracking, all those different things. We, we think this is an important part of what we do, um, understanding our home planet. And these missions provide us the data that, that, that allows us to actually provide all the science we need to understand what's going on. We also have what's called an airborne campaign, where we use aircraft. We, we mount just regular planes that have, we put a ton of sensors on them so they can fly over areas as well as we go forward. We're using the International Space Station now as a potential 
uh, as, a, as a platform to put, put earth science measurements on as well. All of this is helping us. We, this is a global endeavor with us. We work this with our international partners. We, to, to give you an idea what that, how that works, is we, we work with over 120 countries at NASA. We have over 800 agreements with other countries, and a lot of them are in the earth science area, where they have instruments and they have measurements where they're trying to understand all, all we can about the earth, and we share that data so that as a collective global community, we can understand what's going on there. So exciting time here. We're going to launch two more missions next year. Um, to help, uh, help understand the way, one of them, it will help us understand the way gravity affects the water levels that are really the aquifers. Um, so it's really exciting stuff. We're still trying to push on those kind of things going forward. As we push out, think about it, we're pushing out now. We're going to go toward Mars, right? Um, our, our, our job here at, 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 from a Mars perspective is twofold science. We have rovers there today. We've been on Mars for a long time. People say, you're going to Mars. I, I go, we, we're already there. Uh, the, if you look at Mar uh, the rover Curiosity is there today. Um, and, and these robotic missions are kind of our scout missions. If we're, if we're going to take humans, we send scouts, right? Um, and the, so the robotic missions are there. They're providing us the data we need before we take humans um, at some point. And we're pushing to put humans out there further. And I'll talk about that when I get to the, the human exploration part. But Mars is a fascinating body, right? It's a chance for us, it's the closest, our, our nearest neighbor and, our, and probably the closest for us to actually put humans on and try to understand if we can actually live there in the future. These missions that go are, are great, have great scientific value to learn the science of Mars and it helps us with understanding what, how, a, how a planet changes over billions and billions of years. Um, but it also gives us the precursor data we need. This particular mission to Mars 2020 that's coming up, we're actually putting an instrument on there that's called MOXIE. And MOXIE is going to see if we can pull oxygen out of the atmosphere um, at Mars. And then if we can, I don't have to take it with me, right, if we can build a system that allows us to do that. So uh, very, very, very fun stuff. How many folks uh, saw the movie The Martian? Or maybe I should say, who didn't see the movie The Martian? Because <laughs> I don't want to give away anything. All right. So, but, but, but The Martian, you know, you saw a lot that was there and a lot of, uh, a lot of really... Good, good activities and where we, where we would like to get to someday, except we hope to bring the guy back. So that's our goal. So, uh, that, and that's what we'll do with our systems going forward. So, but Mars is, is clearly an, an area of specific interest for us uh, moving forward. We're also, move, as you move out toward the asteroid belt, there's a couple of places we're going to, we just announced these missions, Psyche and Lucy. Psyche is a study of a, a, a metal core, which we believe is the core, a core very similar to what we have here on Earth. But some of those cores actually collected all the material that made them planets. Others didn't. So why didn't they? And we think this is an opportunity for us to see that. Lucy is a Trojan asteroid. We've always wanted to go see one of those. So we're going to go see, see that and study that as well. Again, just to try to understand the basic early formation of the solar system, all these pieces help us kind of put these stories uh, together as we go forward. Now, um, we're, we're going to continue to look out. And we've got, one more, we've got one more we're doing, which is Cassini. Now, Cassini has been a fascinating mission. This is a mission that has allowed us to see, um, study the rings of Saturn, all this, and, and, and more and more about Saturn. And what we've been doing is we've been doing this roughly 20, or 20 years, trying to study the, all that we can about Saturn. Well, this mission is about to come to an end. And, and we're going to plummet Cassini into, the, into, into, this, into Saturn. But before it does, its final final laps that it's making, they're going to go between this, the rings and the planet. We've never done that before. I just encourage you, if you haven't seen some of the images we're getting back from this mission, as it goes in between the rings of Saturn and the actual uh, great gas giant that it is, it, you, 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 you should look at some of, those, some of those videos. We're finding things in there we've never seen before, objects, and then, so we're trying to understand how they're there and why they stay there. Um, but it's been a fascinating mission for us, and I think in September we'll be doing its final dive. Um, and again, learning more that we can. The interesting thing about this, and I'll talk about this about all our science, you know, we, we send these missions out for a reason. We're trying to answer some question. There's been a question that's been posed, and, and we want to go understand those questions. What's interesting about it is every one of these missions just creates more questions, right? We may learn something here, but we're going to, and then we'll be thinking about how do we go get the next set of data uh, as we go forward. Now, so that's, that's kind of from a planetary perspective. What we've been doing now, we're going to look out even further, right? And we're going to look out further. We've got a mission called James Webb Space Telescope. And it's the next generation telescope that's going to go with, with uh, 
that's going to follow Hubble. This is the telescope going into the chamber. You'll notice the little people over to the far right to give you some idea how big this, this is. This is a, we move really fast at NASA. Um, <laughs> and so uh, this, this is the telescope being tested. We were, test, we, were, we were doing some tests on it where it went from flat to, to stand it straight up. Um, you can just see, the, first of all, the size of this, this scope, but also the, the, the work that goes in. The, it, this thing's enormous. And we're going to fly it on an Ariane um, rocket, which is uh, with our partners from ESA. Are gonna, um, that's part of the partnership we have, another global partnership we have within NASA. Um, and it flies next year in 2018. And so this is, this is an exciting mission for us. I've um, been working on this one for a while. We expect it to look back roughly 14 billion years. No, no big deal uh, as we go forward. So let's see if I can get this. Okay. Yep, here we go. All right. So now let's talk about human exploration a little bit. So um, when, you, when you talk about us going out from a scientific perspective, we clearly would like human explorers to follow down the road, right? This is our new class of astronauts. We just named them here a couple of weeks ago. 12 astronauts out of 18,000 applications. The most we've ever had apply uh, to be astronauts at NASA. So you can imagine when you get down to 12, these people have some pretty high qualifications. Uh, in fact, I feel very inadequate when I see their, <laughs> when I see their resumes. They are amazing folks. Um, very excited about these folks. And, and the, the, the fact that they actually want to come do this and take part in this journey is, is really encouraging to us, right? It's what we want to go do as we move forward. So really exciting when we look at that. So what's, how are we going to push them out there, right? How are we going to get people out? So we're building two new, two new systems, the Orion spacecraft and the space launch system that will take it. Space launch system is the rocket that you see on your right. Sorry, it's tough when I'm standing here. Uh, and, the, and the vehicle that the crew will ride in is on the left. The uh, uh, ESA, the European Space Agency, is actually providing the service module. That's the part with the solar arrays you see, the, the thing sticking out there to the side of Orion. They're providing that. That's where we were in Bremen yesterday. Uh, it's being built in Bremen, uh, Germany. And we were there yesterday checking the status of that. Another great international cooperation. This, this system here will take humans further than we ever have before, probably to start with in the area around the moon, but on the, you know, further than we have when we went there uh, during the Apollo days. And it'll lead to us building the systems that we're going to build to take people to Mars in the 2030s. So this, this vehicle is expected to launch in uh, 2019 um, with no crew. And then in 2022, we'll have crew. We'll do a test flight, and then we'll put crew on it. So this is part of our, our future system. This gives you an idea of Orion. Uh, we have already flown an Orion test craft once. We flew what's called Exploration Flight Test 1. And I'm going to show you a video in a minute. And when you see the video, if you'll notice, there's one scene where you'll see, you'll see the, uh, a spacecraft actually re-entering the Earth. There'll be some nice flames and really plasma going by the windows. That was the test we did on this. But that's the structural cell that shell of the, of the capsule. And you can see one of the things we do a lot of is parachute testing. Parachutes have to work. Uh, when you come home, because um, anyway, when you look at the engine testing that we've been doing, uh, this is these are the, the old space shuttle main engines. Uh, I actually grew up testing these. That's where, where I started in my life. Um, and then these are solid rocket motors that you see here. You're going to see some test firings here in a minute. These are based off what we did with the space shuttle. So we actually understand this hardware. And when you're developing a launch system, typically the challenge you have is the propulsion system. So we're pretty fortunate to have these systems in place that we can build off of uh, moving forward. Here's the video.
cool, huh? All right. Yeah, this is definitely an exciting time for us. You can see all the activities that are going on uh, and, the, and the, the, the sheer amount of development of hardware that's happening in, in the States and really around the world is, is pretty awe-inspiring. Awe and, and, and we're doing all that while we're flying the most incredible laboratory you can even imagine, the International Space Station. We call this off the Earth, for the Earth. Um, how many have seen the International Space Station go overhead? All right, for those of you that haven't, right, you can Google space station sightings and it'll tell you when it's gonna come over. Either It's usually either in the morning or in the evening, uh, right, and you'll see it. It'll be the brightest star in the sky um, and it'll be moving pretty fast. So we're moving at about 17,500 miles an hour around the Earth constantly. Uh, it's an amazing laboratory. What we, what we get to do is, is pretty, pretty phenomenal. By the way, if the lights are flashing, that's an airplane. Just, just to let you know, so, so uh, that won't be the right one. But, but seriously, I, I encourage you to do that. You guys are very fortunate here. You have a lot of places where you don't necessarily, you can go where the city lights don't bother you. In the States, I have a problem because I live in Washington, D.C., so it's hard to see the station sometimes. But here, you can, it's, it's, a, it's a gorgeous sight to see that thing come over. And knowing that there are six human beings on there, and, they, and people have been on there for over 16 years now, not the same people. Uh, <laughs> We, we bring them home every six months. Um, but part of the reason we're using the space station is to understand the effects on the human body. When we go to Mars, we're talking a two to three year mission minimum, right? And so what you want to know is what happens to the human body, because in microgravity, we know there are effects. We know things do occur that we, that we need to deal with. We need to put protocols in place to understand that. We just, we just recently flew a one year mission. We called it the twin study. We had Scott Kelly, who actually is one of our astronauts. One of the other astronauts is his twin brother named Mark. So Scott went to orbit for a year, and Mark stayed here. And so we, we're testing each of them. As you might imagine, there are, there are guinea pigs for a lot of this that we're doing for the medical research we need to do. And so we'll follow the progression now that, they're all, now that Scott's home to see what the difference is. But a lot of issues we've got to deal with when we think about radiation and we think about the kind of things the astronauts will have to do, bone loss, vision, the things they'll deal with as they, as they travel on these long missions. But we've got, we've got things in place, and that's what we're learning here on the International Space Station. It's also a place where we can test a lot of the technologies that we need to, that we need to, to, under, to, to build systems that we're going to actually take to Mars with us or help us get to Mars. So this is an incredible, incredible uh, facility, basically the size of a football field. Um, so it's just a massive up there. It's also allowed us in the States to actually create a whole new industry. We call it the commercial spaceflight industry, and, and that's where your, your teams like SpaceX that I'm sure you've heard of, uh, Orbital ATK, are companies that have built their own rockets to provide cargo transport to the International Space Station. Now we're using uh, two providers to actually provide crew. And so hopefully in 20, 20, late 20, 2018 or early 2019, we'll see the first launches of uh, American astronauts on commercial providers uh, to space, to, to the International Space Station. This is very exciting for us. It's very exciting for our industry uh, in the States. Um, and so hopefully we'll get there. You can see the test, you can see where they are. Boeing has what they call uh, CST-100 or Starliner, and then the SpaceX guys have Dragon, what they call the Dragon crew, that's gonna fly us there. So here's kind of the science going on. You can see some of the stuff going on. You, got, you see the exercise happening, uh, very important. The medical research that we do, um, that I talked, don't, talked about earlier for, for the crew. Here's the, the veggie. This is the first time we grew lettuce. Uh, on station, and you can see the teams eating it. We, they haven't told me if they liked it or not. Uh, it was, but but they do. They did eat it. Um, so it's, again, all the things that we need to do. Fire. You can see the work we're doing here with uh, testing testing fire. What happens in microgravity environment when you have a fire? How does it propagate? How does it spread? Very important for us to understand as we as we go forward. And then not only that, we have ways of figuring out how do we put it out. You know, you don't want to be in that mode going forward. And then on the right is actually heart cells that we have beating on the International Space Station, trying to understand the difference and in, in how, they, how they react in the microgravity environment versus here on Earth, where we're, we're under what they call 1G or, or just regular gravity. The other thing we've done recently is we've actually, um, we're, we're, we're learning more and more about DNA. We, we've mapped DNA for the first time. Um, when Kate Rubens was on orbit here recently as one of our astronauts, and today, um, Peg Whitson, Peg, Peggy Whitson is, is the long, has the most time of any astronaut on, on orbit, so 
pretty awesome to think about Kate coming home and Peg coming up. And I think it's even more awesome today when you're talking about today being uh, International Women in Engineering Day, right? So part of this is we gotta, we, we gotta make sure we have a diverse group working for us here in the agency. And I can't think of two bigger, better role models than we got there. Do we have any women engineers in the audience today? Or studying engineering? Come on, don't be shy, raise your hand. Okay, you can stand up. We'll give you a hand. Seriously, I'm gonna make you stand up, it's okay. These are the folks we needed to keep going. Thank you. Sorry, I'll give you a pen for that. It'll be okay. We'll be all right. So as we move forward, but 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 seriously, that's that's what we want. And when we're trying to do what we need to do, we need the entire population to help us. And we need everybody to think about how they how they're going to do that. And two great role models here as we move forward. The technologies that we're working on up there, you can see the the habitable structure. Um, again, that took about what you're seeing took about eight hours. Uh, didn't open up that fast. But that is a uh, an expandable module made by Bigelow Aerospace. It's called the uh, expand. Ex expandable activity module. So we've put that on station. It's been up there almost a year, just at a year. Um, and we're testing that system to see how can it handle the environment of microgravity. One of the challenges we have up in space is what's called debris, micro, micrometeorite debris. These are little pieces of debris moving it over more than 17,500 miles an hour. So they're like little bullets. And we have to track that to make sure they don't take out our systems. And so this having a, habit, having a structure like this gives us an idea how can they handle it if they get hit. We can, we can put shielding up in a lot of places, but sometimes you can't. And as we're going on our journey further, we need to know. You can see the robotic part of this. This is the robot. The robot in the middle is called Robonaut. And Robonaut actually does some of the activities now that the, that the astronauts used to have to do. Um, pretty simple stuff, but it's still stuff that they can go do, flip switches, push buttons, things like that that are on the, that are on the station and do some of the kind of station keeping. It's really a great, a great collaboration as well. Our, our, our work in robotics, and I think the thing that we're doing on the station to actually develop how you would use robotics in space is actually pretty fascinating. The last mission that we did um, from SpaceX had two science missions in it in, in what we call the trunk. There's a part of, the, uh, part of a, a vehicle that goes up that, that's an unpressurized area. So we put these two missions in the trunk. Well, while the astronauts were asleep, we used robotics to take the two experiments out and install them on the International Space Station. Years ago, that would have taken uh, a spacewalk which is, a, you know, we don't do those lightly, right? Those are tough, but the astronauts wake up, the new science mission is already installed on the outside of space station. So we think this combination of human and robotics is something that we're gonna continue to build on as we move forward. And space station is allowing us to demonstrate that. That's what's cool about the International Space Station. In space manufacturing, we actually have a 3D printer on this International Space Station. And our goal is to try to make some of the tools and make some of the stuff we need instead of taking it all with us. Can we actually make things um, that allow us to actually repair replace uh, as, as we move on these long duration journeys. It's really hard if you're gonna go to Mars for two to three years to think you got, what all do you have to bring with you? Or can you actually make some of it as you go? And I think that's one of the things we're trying to do there. So actually been fascinating. And then refueling is another area that we're thinking about, that we're using. One of the, one of the largest things you have to take is propellant. Um, and it's also, also one of your limiters when you have a spacecraft, is what lets it fly around up there. When that runs out, the satellite's kind of done and if we could actually refuel these, we can actually maybe have satellites last longer because usually the sensors and everything are fine, right? So, so we're working on refueling and we've got tools that actually repl replicate what would be, you know, for, for us when we, if you're gonna refuel, think about it, you take your gas cap off, right? And you, so how do you do that robotically? And so we put, we have tools that fit on the end of the International Space Station arm. We've got these big panels we put on that outside the station to practice. They go off, they cut the safety wire, which is something holds the cap on, they unscrew the cap. Um, and then, we, then, we, then they go grab the tools and we're actually refueling things back and forth. We think these, while it sounds pretty simple, what I just described is very hard in space. And so having, and having a robotic tool do that is, is pretty fascinating. See, we, and we've proven that we can do this. And that'll be something we need to do as we move on um, going further down the road. I'll talk about the next generation shoulder raise in a minute. I'll show you something that's pretty cool. Um, so the other thing we're doing is, is you can see uh, CubeSats. Right, CubeSats are a pretty important world. If anybody doesn't know what a CubeSat is, it's about this big, okay, it's a cube. Um, put two of them together, that, that's called a one U. Don't ask me, but one U, one unit, right? Put two of them together, you get two U, three U, six U, that's the way it works. And so a lot of folks are building these CubeSats and we're actually getting, it's, it's miniaturizing um, the technologies, whether it's the electronics, whether it's the propulsion, 
where there's the guidance, navigation, and control that come with these. So what we do is we fly these up, and we have a, a, a dispenser um, that we load from inside the space station. You load these CubeSats, and then you launch them. And that's what you see coming out. And don't worry, they're not that close to the solar arrays. They're not going to hit. Uh, we have a pretty good distance between them. But you can see them tumbling. But, but then the, the university researchers, uh, other people that are just developing technologies related to these, this is an opportunity for us to do that. We're going to see the first Irish satellite this afternoon. I'm very excited about going to see that. That's where we're headed. Um, and it'll fly to station, and we'll launch it from station um, in the future. So pretty exciting stuff when you think about what we can do here. This is an interesting area of development, right? Because this is where we're actually getting a lot of folks interested, not only in the university environment, but a lot of people interested in, if I can make these particular CubeSats, if we can work the propulsion and the guidance, and they become more stable, they can become incredibly inexpensive ways to get data down from, from orbit and actually give us good data. Pointing and tracking is the big challenge, and, and t folks are working on this every day. Here's the, the, we talk about advanced solar arrays. When you look at the International Space Station, it's good for, right now we have agreements with all our international partners. There's 15 international partners. We have agreements with them for, uh, till th through 2024. So the station will be there. We think mechanically, if you think of the International Space Station as a, as a vehicle, like your car, we think mechanically it's going to hang in there until at least 2028 or 2030, somewhere in there. So we're doing the engineering design work to see just how long does it do that. But one of the, one of the limiting factors is the solar arrays. They actually degrade, just like, every, just like anybody that has photovoltaics, you know they degrade over time. Um, and so what we've, what we've developed is a rollout solar array that's... It's just what it says. It's a rollout solar array. And you can see this. We just took this one up. This is brand new. Um, I think we just took it up on the last SpaceX mission. And I think just last week, we, um, or maybe it's Sunday, I think we deployed this. So the station arm's holding it. And we're seeing if it can go out and do this. this by the way, it didn't move this fast either. We speed these things up. So we, we're a little slower than that. However, we're generating. This is about a one-tenth um, demonstrator, one-tenth size of what we would use if we needed to really replace the bigger ones that you saw in the original picture. But we're developing like, or generating electricity right now with this. So we're really excited that this technology could be a, a fairly inexpensive way for us to replace the solar rays if we needed to um, as we move down the road. So pretty exciting um, from that perspective. So, so that's kind of what we're doing at a very, very high level at the agency. Um, we think that there's a lot of technologies that we need to do. We, I, I truly believe this is a global endeavor. You know, it's not just NASA. It's not just the United States. It's, frankly, everyone in the, in, in the international environment. And we're all pulling kind of in the same area. We're trying to make those great discoveries. We're really trying to change what we think about. And, and, and it was really, I don't, I don't know how to, it was almost emotional today to come here and get to see the history, right? And think about, if you think about what you see here, what you see every day from a historical perspective, NASA will be 60 years old next, week, next year. 60. Okay? That's incredibly young when you think about the span of time that you see here as you go through some of the history from, that we saw today. So just think about if you look forward 500 years, 1,000 years, think about what we're doing today and what we're, what, what we're challenging today that might be a truth today is not a truth in 500 years because we've learned more. And so that continuity between past and future is what's really important to us. And I think all of us in this room, well, maybe not all of us, I should, I'll speak for me, right? I actually think that this whole journey of exploration is kind of in our DNA. I think it's something we do as humankind, and I think it's something we do together. Um, and, and, and everybody celebrates these, these successes and these missions. Uh, I, I laugh because we, we, we use this phrase quite constantly that says, you know, at NASA, we try to make the impossible possible, right? That's not a very big challenge. Uh, but it's a great it's a great motivator when you give somebody a problem and you say, you know what, we can't do this. It's amazing how many times our teams come through to show that you can do it. So I just tell you, that's where we are, um, what we're working on. I expect someday we're, that, that one of our systems, it may detect life somewhere else in the universe. We may actually put boots on Mars. And I think when we do that, you will see these are civilization level impacts. They're not NASA's, they're not the United States, they're the whole civilization as we know it. I go back in time and when we landed on the moon, if you look at the newspapers when we landed on the moon from the whole world, they said, we did it. We did it. Well, you guys are part of that we. 
And that's why we do what we do to try to push that and go forward. So thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. And I look forward to taking some questions. There is a microphone, so I think uh, make sure you, because I think we're being filmed, right? So, uh, and we're live on Facebook, which is always interesting. So make sure you get a microphone. Questions? Yes, down here. Is there more than 18 elements? More than 18 elements? You're talking about... 100 or something. What? 118. Well, we, that's what's on, as you, he's already told me he likes the periodic table, right? He's, <laughs> he's killing me. He's driving me back. Um, we continue to, I mean, who knows, right? I mean, I think we'll find out as we do more discovery, there could be more because there weren't that, there weren't that many, you know, 50 years ago. We find different elements and we discover different things. So I, I don't know, but I just certainly don't say it's out of the realm of possibility that there could be more, especially when we start seeing what's on other planets. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for your fascinating talk. Uh, uh, with a view to the mission to Mars, I was wanted to ask you for a mission that long for a year or more in, inside a spaceship. How do, they, how do you propose to keep it clean? Uh, yeah, I presume you can't wash it, you can't use chemicals. Uh, do you use special coatings or have you got a solution for that? Yeah, we, we have a pretty extensive, what we call a protocol on the systems that we take out um, before we even leave the, leave the Earth. And then we have a very, um, I would say, a very tight filtering process we use for the air, for instance, and for the water. We collect everything water-wise, um, everything, and turn it back into drinking water. So we have, so we have to do that. And so the, the protocols we have in place have been developed over many years of, it, if you don't get it dirty to start with, you don't have to clean it, right? And so, so we start, we leave with a very clean system. It, it's, it's amazing the things that can happen if you can, if you, if you're just not even careful with what you eat, the crumbs. Think about that. Think about crumbs. They're, they don't go anywhere. They're just floating around, and, and we worry about them getting in the astronauts' eyes. We worry, you know, all those kind of things. So we're very careful on the protocols. And I have a, I have a good friend that's a, that's a former astronaut, and I, when when you eat lunch with her, she eats very carefully, <laughs> and and she has a Ziploc bag, and she takes everything and puts it in the Ziploc bag, and I go. What do you, she's, now the, she's now the center director at Johnson Space Flight Center. She'd probably kill me for saying, telling the story, but <laughs> she, she's so funny. She says, I got trained to do this. You have to package everything up. You, don't want, you do not want anything floating around. So we have, we have very, very distinct protocols to make sure, that first of all, the systems that go are very clean, and then that, we have, that we're very careful as we go, go through that. But it is, it's, the, the filtering and things like that are very important, and, and we have to make sure we're doing that. It's a great question. Uh, yes, right here. Get the microphone. Would humans be able to survive on Mars? We think so. Um, not, not without a suit or a habitat, right? I'm talking uh, if, if like they didn't have an astronaut suit. Uh, no, not right now. <laughs> so you got to have a suit, you got to have a habitat. There is a little bit of gravity and water on Mars. There is, but you still, the, the pre, you still need something for your oh, but it, So it isn't enough? No. Oh. <laughs> Good question, though. Yes, sir. So I know that we have the Orion and things for getting to Mars, but what were the astronauts? Well, they obviously need a bit, not like a space station, but more like a mini kind of transport module mm -hmm. for getting to Mars. What would that be? Yeah, we're, we're working on something called the deep space, deep space transport. Exactly what you just described. It's a, it's a, it's, you, you can't stay in a capsule that long, right? So you need, it's kind of a, a mix between a, uh, just think of a, I'll call it a minivan, right? Because think of something that's about the size of a, or a hotel room, right, that you take with you from that perspective. The way we would do it is we would build that transport kind of bus that, you would, that, that would go from roughly the area around the moon to Mars, and it would come back to the area around the moon, and you would get on a different vehicle to take you home and, and bring you back to Earth. But, yeah, it's got to be pretty, it's got to be larger than what we have today, and, and so that, I mean, that's two or three years you don't want to be trapped in a small place. And it's going to have experiments. It's going to have the exercise equipment so that when they get to Mars, they can still, still operate um, from that perspective. So yeah, we're going to build that, that deep, sp deep space transport is probably the best way to say it. Let's see. How about, yeah. 
Thank you for the delightful talk. Just one question. Maybe you covered some of it in the last answer. How confident are you of getting them back? <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, I've been asked that question a bunch, right? So, so I think the way I answer it is I don't send them if I don't think I can get them back. And so I, I'm, I, I will be very confident before we leave Earth that we can get them home. There's always risk. We always know there's risk. I mean, that's what we do. This is not easy. I don't say that, with, I don't say that flippantly, right? Um, but we will build the systems that, that bring them home as well. So. I know I've asked a few questions, but I, would like, I know this is quite specific. Do you ever, ever pro have problems with the pressure on board, like say with hydrostatics, since the ISS could at some point get closer to the Earth? Could that pressure being affected by gravity have a problem with like the, um, the food on board, the astronauts, things on board that aren't used to being in gravity or aren't designed to be in Earth gravity? What do you, how do you have any solutions for um, hydrostatics, like say on launch, like the fuel could it boil if it's at, um, because of the height that's at? Right, we, what, yeah, great question by the way, how about that? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Come join us, please. Uh, anyway, no, it's a, it's a great question. I think, uh, so, so the way we manage pressure in several ways, I mean there's several ways that we manage it. So. I'll start, I'll start with the rocket part going up. How about that? We'll start with the rocket part going up, and then I'll talk about the International Space Station, and then how we even manage pressure coming home, because it's both, right? Because you're exactly right. Pressure does change. You have to have a system that allows you to manage that. On the rocket part, we typically have a pressurization and a vent system. So if, if pressure comes, if I need more pressure, I have a way to add pressure. If I need to get rid of some, I have a vent system. So it just pushes it, pushes it off board. And if you've ever seen a rocket launch, getting ready for a rocket launch, you'll see the gases coming out the side of the rocket. That's typically the venting going on. If you see the vent close, that means we're pressurizing. So you can, you can actually watch that. Nobody will tell you that's what's going on, but that's, that's what happens as you move forward. When you get to the International Space Station, we have a set pressure that we keep the space station regulated to. And it's just a matter of regulating it. Same kind of process. You can vent the pressures. You can move them up and down pretty easily. Um, in, in the system that we have. Think about when you ride an airplane, that the airplane has a certain pressure on the inside. It's the same kind, of, same kind of process, and they can pressurize and vent as well. Coming home, the capsule that you ride back in, you, you're, you're gonna be, as you come through the atmosphere, the pressure changes in that capsule, and so there's little vents that we use inside the capsule as well so that we can maintain the same pressure going down. So it's, it's just a pressurization and a vent system. I say that like it's easy, but it's pretty complex, as you described, because there's a lot of different variables that, that drive it. Great question, though. Wow. I'll let y'all, right there. Whoop, right behind you. Whoop. I'll get you next. How about that? OK. Um, you, you, you described the, all the activities that NASA is involved in. And of course, NASA operates on a multi-billion uh, budget, but it's a, it's a finite budget. So what I'd be curious to hear from you is, um, if you had a, an, an infinite budget, if you were unconstrained by budget, what would be the uh, priority activities that then you would be, in addition to your current activities, be focused on at NASA? Uh, okay, so um, if I had everything in the world, no. I, you know, I think, I think for us, it's not necessarily about the budget and having an all-consuming budget to just kind of speculate on what that would mean. I think for us, what we do is is we understand the balance of how much we get, budget-wise, especially in the states, and actually globally. You know, our European partners contribute quite a bit to what we're trying to do. And what we try to do is prove our value, and we balance that value with, with other things that governments could be spending their money on from our standpoint. We use commercial partners. We bring in commercial partners quite a bit uh, to do this. I don't think, you know, to me there's a lot we could do. Um, but I think what we do is we try to live within the means we're given and we don't really, you, you can't, what you can't do in the reality of it, it'd be great to have this exercise and say, oh, you know, if we got this, we could do this. I think the real way to do it for us in, in the, is to recognize the reality of the physical constraints that we're all under um, and do the best program we can with the dollars that we get. And so what you see is we spend a lot of time with the current program making sure it fits the budget profile we expect over time. That changes. As you, as you and I discussed earlier, it changes quite often. 
But when it changes, it allows us to actually lean on an international partner, you know, bring them to the game to help us do something, or a commercial, and the state's one of our commercial partners. So we really think it's the overall economics that's pretty important for us in terms of driving an industrial base, driving our international cooperation, and having kind of common goals going forward. So that's, I mean, it's, I could speculate all day on, on having more, but we'll do it. Can you go back there? She was holding her hand up, please. I think. Thank you so much. NASA has for a long time been in the forefront of citizen science, mm -hmm. of engaging uh, the general population, including school children, in designing experiments, for example. I wonder if you could speak to what you believe is the importance of citizen science and uh, your use of social media to yeah. do so. Yeah, so I, I think, I, so let me start back historically. Um, if you go back to the 60s, really the 50s, NASA engaged the public. Um, really, it was kind of when Sputnik happened. We, we wanted folks to help us with what anything we could do from a, a visual perspective, probably even before that with, with scopes. Our job has been to put the data out there because there's a lot of data that we, that we collect from a lot of our instruments. And you can't always have um, the, 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 the actual scientists that wanted the data. It's a lot more data than sometimes they can use. And so we put the data out there after a period of time where anybody can look at it and have findings. We've had those recently. You know, as people have looked at data that was generated, you know, not immediately, but they've looked at pouring through all this data, they find things. Citizen Science to us is important. We, I, get, I get emails, I get calls, I get stuff all the time. Now, fast forward to the environment we're in today, the social media world we're in today, we, we try to take advantage of that in, in a big way. I think we lead the, you guys, my, we lead the whole government in, in where we are. Um, we've actually taken over the, the trending on Twitter before, uh, more so than some other things. When we did the Trappist One, which was the discovery of seven, not the, not the one we did with 10 yesterday, but the seven that we did, Trappist One, about two months ago, I think, roughly, we had over four billion hits, four billion with a B, um, through all our social media, whether it was Facebook, whether it was Twitter, Instagram, all the things we do. So I think we use that, the reason it's important to us is we use that to reach out to a different generation and a different crowd because I need them to come help us. You know, I need somebody standing up here in 40 years that's not me, uh, preferably, um, so, they can, so they can tell the story of what we're trying to do. And I guarantee you the journey of exploration and discovery will be the same. We'll all be trying to push for that next level. It probably will be different in terms of what we're doing because we will have learned in the last 40 years. So, so social media to us has become a great tool for us to tell our story, but also engage people that we might not have engaged before. And I think we've seen, we've seen that in a big way with our social media campaign. Um, and I think those become our ambassadors without me having to be an ambassador, right? And again, I think it gets back to the, it's just written, most people are just excited about what we're trying to do uh, going forward. This is tough, now you've got lots of answers. Are there any plans for a replacement space station when the um, ISS expires? Yeah, so right now, what we're doing is we're looking at from, from an in, we, we would like to have a, what we call, the, the space station is what we call low Earth orbit, okay? That's the area where the space station resides, roughly just imagine 200 to 300 miles above us. Um, we don't have any plans to build another space station, per se, but we know a lot of industry would like to put up what they call free-flying uh, laboratories that we could take advantage of. What we want to do is build the next set of infrastructure around the moon, um, and it would not be like the space station today, probably smaller, a smaller set of infrastructure where we can operate around the moon and test systems out that are going to have to last longer than what station systems do. Today I can actually, so if you think about this as Earth, I keep doing my hands, sorry. Here's Earth, stations right here, here's moon, and there's Mars way out there, probably over by the door. Uh, you know, if I can move out here and start testing these systems, it, it, it's better for me. This, but I need that, I need some help in low Earth orbit. And so that we, we're hoping some of the commercial entities come along with that to help with these independent flyers, but we'll have something around the moon so we can still keep testing our systems going forward. And then those systems will be the ones that go to the deep space, eventually go into deep space transport as we go to Mars. So. Last one. What would be the best way to start training for like, no, being a worker in NASA. Ah. <laughs> I can answer that one. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I think for me, it, 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 so, so we talk about science, technology, engineering, and math, right? I think so, first of all, um, if you, it, it depends on what you want to do, right? And I think from an engineering perspective or a scientist's perspective, it's just focus on the studies around science and engineering. Do your math, do your chemistry, <laughs> as we heard over here. Um, stick with that from an engineering perspective. But, but also don't lose the fact that, that we need communicators. We need lawyers, we need business folks. We, we need folks, we need more than just engineers and scientists. Now the engineers and scientists are really important and it's a great place to go, but it takes a lot of folks to go do that. So the main thing is study, study hard, uh, harder, uh, <laughs> and, and, and just stick to it. Um, I can tell you as someone that graduated in engineering, it's, it can be uh, a very difficult and challenging time um, but you got to stick to it, because when you stick to it, you get to do some, in, some amazing things. Um, so I just tell you to stick with your science and your, your math for now. Um, and when you get into the university system, then you can go into engineering or science, whichever way you want to go. Um, but just stick to it. That's the other part. Don't give up. Too many people give up these days, because it is hard. Um, but the reward is just phenomenal. You get to work on stuff like I showed you today. Well, look, thank you guys for having me. I appreciate the time. And uh, good to see you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I work in the European Space Agency and I work in NASA, and that was truly inspirational. It uh, actually brought a tear to my eye at one point. Um, so um, thank you so much. And I wanted to highlight to some of the younger folks in the room here today that Ireland still hasn't had an astronaut. And I think that's a challenge to your generation to get out there, get your maths degrees, get your medical degrees, get all your training, and get out into space to be the first Irish person in space. So to quote maybe a family relative in distant, to infinity and beyond, <laughs> that was Buzz, Buzz Lightyear, not Lightfoot. But thank you very much to the administrator again. And uh, it was a fascinating and truly inspiring talk. <laughs>